Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Go ahead and take your Bibles this morning. We're going to go and spend some time in the Word. We're going to Matthew 5, and we're also going to spend a lot of time in Romans uh, this morning, Romans chapter 3. So if you have your Bible and you want to get it ready, that would be great. We're going to have a lot of Scripture. You might want to write some notes today. I feel like teaching a little bit, and I feel like there's going to be lots that you'll want to follow through with later on. Um, And so just even if you're jotting the Scriptures down and looking at that together uh, later on, that would be great. So we're in a Names of God series, hence the video. Um, and it's been, one, this is the ninth week. I can't believe where summer's flying, but how many people like kind of like feeling like falls in the air in the morning and is like, oh no, here we go. Summer's flying by. But if it's week nine of our summer series, yeah, how many weeks we have of summer? Nine, probably. It looks like, feels like it this morning. But we're, uh, we're walking through this tremendous teaching series, and I've really enjoyed. And if you didn't, weren't here last week, um, Pastor Steve Fleming had a tremendous message on Jehovah Shalom. How many people were here last week? And, and yeah, wasn't that a beautiful? My wife and I, Sonia, she's at home today, still recovering from shingles, so thank you for praying for her. Um, but we, she watched it, I think, three times, like just over. Like It really ministered to our family. And uh, if you haven't seen it yet, it's on our YouTube page. So, um, so today we're talking about Jehovah I'll tell you how to say it. Sid Canoe. Forget the T in front of it. We'll throw that on the screen. Jehovah Sid Canoe. Everybody say that with me. Jehovah Sid Canoe. It's like a kid's canoe. That's how I remember it. Uh, a kid's canoe, but without the T in there. So it's Sid's canoe. All right. And the Lord, our righteousness. Just a little uh, a tidbit of in this, yeah, it doesn't even matter if I say this, but I'm going to say it anyways. I have never preached on this message before in my life. I've never preached on the theme of this message before. I understood it when I was a really young Christian, and I have no idea why I never took the time to unpack it and study it as much as I did in the last little while to share with you. I am thrilled with what God is about to say to our hearts today. Before I do that, just want to give a little announcement. It's kind of just random in advance. But we're having a special luncheon, Abundance Canada. Um, They used to be the Mennonite Foundation. They're coming to Bethany after church on Sunday the 15th. And they will be presenting a little financial seminar for those who who want to learn about finances and giving and generosity and budgeting and all the different things when it comes to finances. A while back, the board asked me to kind of like find some tools and some resources. So they're willing to come. And we're going to start up sign-ups. Uh, they're actually offering a free lunch. They're bringing the lunch and providing it, which is kind of cool. For those who really want to understand this area of their life a little better, a couple weeks ago, f- three weeks ago, I shared about Jehovah Jireh, our provider. And a lot of questions came from that about tithing and giving and generosity. And so here's a seminar. It's about an hour and a half or so um, seminar, which will help us in this area. If you want more teaching on finances and how to serve God with your money, this is a great seminar. Also, a little bit about long-range planning, retirement ideas, a whole bunch of stuff. And then there'll be a little bit of a question answer, personal question answer time with the staff of Abundance Canada. So just putting that out there, um, you'll hear a little bit more details in the next few weeks. All right. Uh, I'd like to start with something a little funny this morning. Um, I, I heard about an elderly couple. Uh, they were sitting on their front porch swing. Remember those front porch? Anybody have a front porch swing? They're, yeah, some of you do. They're sitting on the front porch swing on their 60th anniversary. Isn't that beautiful? You can just picture it in your mind there. And they're celebrating the 60th, feeling very romantic. The husband said to his wife, honey, our love is tried and true. She had difficulty hearing, so she said, what did you say? And he goes, honey, our love is tried and true. And she said one more time, what in the world are you saying? Would you please speak up? Frustrated, he shouted, I said, our love is tried and true. She turns to him, I'm sick and tired of you too. (laughs) Okay. Oh, here we go. It's got nothing to do with my message, but it was so funny when I heard it. Um, I really felt the stirring of the Holy Spirit in the preparation for this message. just want to tell you that sometimes the Lord speaks to me before he ever speaks through me. And I know the Lord really ministered to my heart in this area. Um, 
And I believe the Holy Spirit is stirring in this place right now. The worship time was absolutely wonderful. Thank you for engaging in your heart with worship. I, I don't want the enemy to steal anything from your life. I don't want the enemy to steal your spiritual life, the joy of your spiritual life. I don't want the enemy to steal by lying to you about your relationship with him. Jehovah Sid Canoe is a revelation that's found in scripture that needs to be a revelation that's found in your heart. The Bible's very clear that we're changed from glory to glory. Day by day, it gets brighter and brighter, but yet I don't know if that's everybody's testimony that they could say days are getting better and better, where a lot of people thinking that things are getting worse and worse and worser. Some people have this idea that as the older you get, the more difficult life is, but the reality is when the glory of the Lord reveals some things to your life, that there can be great joy. In fact, Jesus says, I pray that your joy may be what? Say that again. Full. That your joy may be full. So in a sense, the more we know Jesus, the greater joy we should be experiencing. The greater fullness of his glory should be revealed to our hearts. The greater anticipation and expectation and excitement that, are, that as we grow in him, the more we have of him. Isn't that good news? And that should be all of our testimonies. Let me speak to you in church language, that the latter days will be better than your former days. Amen? Amen. Do you believe that's in scripture? Do you believe that's true? Then why don't we believe that for ourselves personally? I think the revelation of this message will really help us. This message should make you thirsty. (laughs) This message, this message, This message should make you what? Thirsty. I would believe that you would be more thirsty for God after hearing what God wants to speak to your heart. I believe that you'd be more thirsty for right relationships with others once you hear what God speaks to your heart. I believe that this message will make you more thirsty for peace, for his presence, for more victory in your life. I believe you'll be hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Hallelujah. If you're not thirsty today, I can't help you. Only God can make you thirsty. Only your desire to be hungry and thirsty after him. Now when we look at blessed are those, scripture, Matthew 5, 6. Blessed, everybody say blessed. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be what? Filled. Hallelujah. God wants to bless those who are hungry for righteousness, thirsty for righteousness. Anyone thirsty in the house today? Come on, even by faith, go ahead and fake it, even if you don't want to know if you're thirsty or hungry. Let's just have that anticipation. So the Lord, our righteousness, that's what Jehovah Sid Canoe actually means. But what in the, in the world do these two words, tr- tremendous as they are, mean to me personally? Well, we know that Jehovah is the personal name of God, the Yahweh, the the beautiful name of the Lord himself. And Sidkenu, while the word we're not necessarily familiar with, some of you might have heard this for the very first time, it means our righteousness. It's not just his righteousness, but the Lord, our righteousness. It's not just that God is righteous, but he is a relationship with us where he who is righteous can become our righteousness. It's a beautiful thing. Altogether, Jehovah Sidkenu means the Lord our righteousness, which is in Hebrew. And a similar word in the Greek is the word dikosone. Dikosone, where we get the word deacon, which is kind of fascinating. Dikosone and righteousness are the same thing. Those who want to serve the Lord as a deacon actually are following righteousness to do what's right in serving the Lord with gladness. Matthew 5, 6 in a different translation says this, how good is life for those who hunger and thirst for dikosone, because they will be satisfied. Hallelujah. Now, the gospel is about Jesus, and the gospel isn't necessarily about you. But the more we understand what the gospel is, the more we realize the benefits of the good news gospel. That's what it means. The good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, truly is 
good news for you. Hallelujah. And with a proper, without a proper view of God, you'll never have a proper view of yourself. So if you don't know who Jehovah Sidkenu is, you don't necessarily know the kind of relationship and who you are in that relationship with God. Dikasone, or righteousness, means right living with God. Right living with God, right living with other people, right living with creation that's around us. And we act with righteousness when we live, hear me carefully, this is the end result, we live justly, we live honestly, we live faithfully according to the instruction found in God's word. God also does righteousness towards us, which is amazing. That is, he does right by his covenant promises. When God promises, he's not just faithful, he's righteous. And he will do what he says he will do. How many promises are in the Bible? Hundreds of them. And every one of those promises that are from God, he is faithful to fulfill those promises, but he is also righteous that he will do right by his word towards us. Every single one of us. Nobody is exempt from that. He does right by his covenant promises. We've seen it throughout Old Testament for the people of Israel by sending Israel and the rest of the world, hallelujah, us included, the promised Messiah, who is Jesus. God promised, he sent him, and now we have actually a Messiah on this side of the cross. We look back and say it was Jesus. In the Old Testament, they looked and they knew there was a Savior, a Messiah coming, and his name is Jesus. God is the only one who can provide that kind of answer for us and that kind of righteousness for us. Ultimately, in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, our righteousness. Jesus, hear me out, who became sin for us, watch this in 2 Corinthians 5.21, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Say this with me. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I want you to say that one more time. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, theologically, that seems like a really deep concept, because it is. But how do we live into that reality that literally I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? That's what Scripture says and proves over and over again to be true. I am the righteousness of God. So where did the revelation of Jehovah Sid Canoe begin? Where did God decide to reveal that to his people? Where is it in scripture? So Jeremiah chapter 33, we'll look at a few verses there before we go to Romans. But Jeremiah 33, this is where we find his name. Verse 14 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I promised to the house of Israel. Remember we're talking about God promising? So I promised the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. This is Jesus. He shall execute, New King James says, judgment but the actual name should be justice. Actual translation in the original language is, he shall execute justice and righteousness in the earth. Now, let me just pause it before I finish this verse. Judgment and righteousness, justice and righteousness is the same. When you see justice, you could superimpose righteousness. Now, justice is giving you an example of how it works out, but righteousness is the state in which we live in. So justice and righteousness are actually hand in glove. They, they're, they're tied together. So when you see justice, you could actually see righteousness as the core holding the box, so to speak, the, the covering of word justice. Justice without righteousness is just man's idea of making things right. But true justice only comes through God's righteousness working together. So here it is again. So he, Jesus, the branch of David, the branch of righteousness, he shall execute, fulfill, 
bring, up, bring to pass justice and righteousness in the earth. Verse 16, in those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she, isn't that weird? Oh, hang on, we'll pause there for a second. She will be called. Who will be called? Well, the house of Israel, the house of Judah, and the church. How many people know the church is the bride? So sometimes throughout scripture, the church is called a her. All right, I'm not going to get into all the reasons for that. But guys, you're the bride of Christ. Come on. We're looking for a real man to say amen. (laughs) You're okay with that. All the, all the men, just go ahead and say, amen. amen. Do you understand everything? No, I don't know how I'm a bride. I don't know, but I am. That's what the Bible says. So she will be called, all right, the Lord our righteousness. So the house of Israel, the house of Judah, the church of Jesus Christ will be called the house, the Lord our righteousness. How in the world are we getting labeled with his name? It's amazing. So when the world looks at us, they're going to see the Lord, our righteousness. Now, we see, we want them to see the Lord who is love, joy, peace, all the fruit of the Spirit lived in our lives, but also righteousness is this incredible force that God wants us to live into. I'm excited about this. Can you tell? Now, the reality is this is an amazing revelation that can come to our hearts. Where did that come from, the Lord, our righteousness? Well, back in Jeremiah 23, 5, you don't have to turn there. And it says almost the same thing. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute justice and righteousness in the earth. And that verse 6 of of, uh, Jeremiah 23 says, and he is Jehovah Sidkenu. All right. Now, some of you are looking at me like an old cow at a new gate. I'm going to just hang on for a second. Every, I need you to participate. In fact, I need you to stand with me and make this work. You got to just stand with me for a second. Work, work with me here, people. Some of you are falling asleep and I just need to wake you up. No, I need you, to, I need you to follow along with me for a second. I need you to take your right arm, your right hand, if you can, you can lift it. And I want you to just take it to your side a bit here. And I just want you to shake your hand for a second. All right, shake your hand. Come on, you can do it. Shake your hand. That's good. Now make it into a fist. All right. And now watch this. Place it beside your chin. Where's your chin? You guys. Thank you very much. You may be seated. (laughs) See, I'm talking about chin, and you guys are thinking cheek. I know it sounds the same. Cheek, chin starts with ch, so maybe that's, I'll give you that. But this is what happens when we're actually hearing scripture, when we're listening, when we're watching, what sometimes we get caught up into what we perceive as opposed to what God is saying. So I want your hearts to be a little bit more open, the fact that God's got some things down here for you as well. All right? Does that sound good? That was fun. I'd like to turn with you now to Romans chapter 3. This is where we'll unpack this. Romans chapter 3. And I'm going to read a few passages here. I'll go verse by verse. Righteousness is one of the key themes of Scripture. You might not necessarily see it, but it's there all throughout Scripture. But we know so little about it. If you're not righteous, you're unrighteous. There's nothing in between, and heaven is made for the righteous. I think it's important that we understand it. All of God's promises and blessings are for the righteous. Is it important? So in the King James translation, I'll read most of it from the New King James, but in the King James translation and most translations, we have these two words, like I said, just and righteous, justice and righteousness, as I said earlier. But bear in mind that the original languages, both in the Hebrew and in the Greek, both Old Testament and New Testament, these two words translate from the one original word together. They're inseparable from the original root meaning. And the word just and righteous are the exact same word. Now, the things that these two English words cover, they cover the total range of meaning, but each have a different association. So when we talk about just, we're talking more or less about the legal requirements to fulfill the law. What is just? The law itself. 
when we talk about righteous, we're talking about the terms of how a person lives by, but I want to assure you this morning, hear me carefully, is that you cannot make the distinction between the two. They work together because it, it's there, it isn't there in scripture where you can separate it. In other words, you cannot have a theoretical justice before God, which doesn't work out in righteous living. It's always tied together. It's an artificial distinction if you try to separate them. Where the scripture says justified, I love that word justify. When you hear the word justified, when you see the word justify, you could say just as if I'd never sinned. I, so when I read that word justified, I always remember I'm justified like I've never sinned. How many people think that's mind blowing? How many people have sinned before? Come on. Those who didn't put up their hand, liar, liar, pants on fire. So you sinned. Okay. How many people have sinned before? Go ahead and do that now. Now everybody, here we go. The blood of Jesus, because of the cross of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, just as if I'd, we've been justified, just as if I'd never sinned. How many people think that is mind-blowing? It's like, what? How does that work? I, I still, I remember God goes, you're my son, you're my daughter, just as if I'd. That's what you've been, justified. Ever say justified? justified? It's a beautiful thing. I have to train myself to say that I've been made righteous. I find an argument in some people's minds in this area. I find people who've been raised in certain fundamentalist teachings who say that you're still a wretched Filthy, dirty worm. Did the blood of Jesus work? Are you a new creation in Christ? Or are you still the old dead person that you used to be? What are you? New creation or old dead person when you gave your life to Christ? Okay, so let's go to the Bible and follow what the Bible says and live according to the Bible and talk about what the Bible says. You are a new creation in Christ. You've been justified. You've been made right with God. You are no longer a wretched, I, I love amazing grace, who saved, past tense, a wretch like me. I was definitely a wretch. Whatever that really means. It's a hard word to figure out. I was lost. How about that? But now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was dead in my sin, but now I'm made alive unto Christ. Come on, church. Have we moved from the old to the new? You are no longer a wretch. Quit calling yourself a wretch. That is not who you are. Otherwise, you're making the blood of Christ null and void. You're saying it wasn't good enough. Jesus didn't change my life. He's not really my Savior. He's not really Lord. Come on, Jesus is Lord. All right, I'm getting a little passionate here because I hate religion that puts people in wretched boxes. There's a whole online YouTube world of wretched. Don't Google it. Those guys are really, really crusty. Everything's, you're rotten, filthy, no good in religious words. That is not the Bible. Genesis to Revelation, in fact, index to maps, you'll never find that you are still wretched. Impossible. You've been made new and alive under Christ. Amen. Amen. That, is, that is the good news. So here's what it means. Romans chapter 3. We're finally there. Romans 3. We're going to go verse 20 to 30. Let me begin with verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. So in other words, if you fulfilled everything in the law and you were perfect, if you did not have Jehovah Sidkenu in your life and you did everything, fulfilled the law, crossed every T, dotted every I, and you were blameless and faultless, it says here, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. In other words, nice try, but it's not what I need. For by the law, 
is the knowledge of sin. We need the law. The law tells us how many people, you know, you wish there wasn't an OPP or whatever, fulfilling the law when you're driving down the highway. I got pulled over once. I thought I'd do the, oh, my brothers are cops too. Ha ha, this I'll be embarrassed when I tell them. Yeah, the OPP, yeah, here's your ticket. Anyways, it didn't work. It worked once, so I thought I'd try it the second time. Anyways, that's another story. <laughs> now, I, I have great respect when I see the red and blue, the red and blue, red and blue. Aren't you glad you have police officers? To f- I think this world would be chaos without the law, correct? And without law enforcement. God bless law enforcement. We need it in our world because we're, we're, we're dumb. The world is kind of crazy. We'll do dumb things and we'll break the law because we think we'll get away with it because that's just human nature. But the law is, verse 20, is the knowledge of sin. No one is ever going to be reckoned righteous before God by the observation of the law, period. It's an impossibility. So you've got to rule it out. It'll never happen. Here's the reason, three real quick reasons why the law was given. Three reasons right here. Number one, to give knowledge of sin, to tell us what is actually sin. We needed that. So the law reveals the knowledge of sin. We got it. Number two, to prove to them that we cannot save ourselves. That's the second reason why we got the law. And the third reason is to point to a savior who could save us from our sin. God never expected anybody to be righteous enough by keeping the law. It's impossible. All your self-righteousness is like filthy rags, Isaiah says. God's righteousness comes by faith alone. Beautiful. Now, the problem with religious people, don't think I'm talking to you unless I am, is it often takes years and years and years to discover that you cannot save them yourself. Religious people have a hard time realizing that they can't save themselves. It's kind of strange. But the reality is they cannot make themselves righteous. Indeed, many religious people never make that discovery. There's there's people in churches on this Sunday morning all over God's beautiful country, Canada, who go to church and are not saved, not born again, not made righteous by God, who are going to church thinking they're fulfilling something to make them right with God, just by going to church, just by being religious. God's righteousness comes through faith alone. Let's go to verse 21. But now... Everybody say, but now. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God. I'll pause right there. Notice that that's a key phrase in the righteousness of God. This is what we're talking about this morning specifically. Not our own righteousness, but the righteousness of God. Many people quote Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, for provision in their life but they don't realize what's, that's, what's said at the beginning of that verse, verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and what? Come on, church. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And when you have his righteousness, all these things will be added unto you. God's going to take care of you. So we're seeking the kingdom and we're seeking what his righteousness is. It's beautiful. All right? Many religious people are seeking their own righteousness, asking God to add his blessing to that. He will not do it. He, he likes if you're nice. That's all good. He likes if you're kind, loving. It's all good. But if you are seeking self-righteousness and not his righteousness, you, you're missing the mark. He will not do it. So he seek first the kingdom of God, righteousness. And verse 22, we'll finish it now, of Romans 3. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And to all and on all, so to all, the Lord our righteousness, he is our righteousness. To all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. What do you mean no difference? There's no difference between a Lutheran and a Baptist, between a Muslim and a Jew and a Catholic and evangelical. There's no difference what kind of religious system you grew up with. 
There's no difference in how you approach it. There's only one way through Jesus Christ, through faith, right there in verse 22, through faith in Jesus Christ. There's only one way of righteousness, and that's the way of Jesus Christ. Can you just say amen? amen. And it's offered to all who what? To, to one thing, all who what? Who believe. Everyone who believes is offered this kind of righteousness. Verse 23 should be familiar to a lot of people. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Let me point out the most important part of that verse. I'm going to point on the screen, the very end in the white, the very last, the comma. That's a good verse. Verse 23, we hear it a lot. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. Yeah, we got that. But we forget there's a comma and not a period. What? You can't separate it from what comes next. So if you're quoting, for all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God, period, you are not being honest with the scripture, with the text. You know, I'm ashamed of the many years when I heard all my life, most times, all the guilt and manipulation and condemnation that I received. In fact, I hated church. Hey, forget the pricky pants. That was, you know, physically... But I hated my mind and soul were bombarded by that was no good. The condemnation. You know why they, they preach condemnation in church, guilt in church? It's to keep people guilty and condemned and coming back to church. That's, that's a sad way to keep motiv people motivated. Is it, guilt is a lousy motivator. But they use it over and over again. And I'm ashamed how many even good-intentioned fundamentalists who use Romans 3.23 like a sledgehammer and have not gone beyond that verse. Amazing love, Jesus did not go through, the, hear, hear me out, Jesus did not go through the world telling people they were sinners. Have you ever realized that? 2 Corinthians 5 says this, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing unto them their trespasses. So Jesus didn't go preach, you are rotten, filthy sinners. Turn or burn. I know a guy, he had a pack of matches in high school. Like those wooden ones. It makes a big noise. And he'd throw a flaming match at people in high school. He just got saved. He was a little, a little, lot of zeal, but nothing else behind the wheel. A lot of zeal. Threw matches. Turn or burn. You're burnt. You're burnt. Hell is hot. This is what he said. Hell is hotter than that. People are like, you know, how many people, that evangelism was crazy. How many people think, what in the world was he thinking? I know what he wasn't thinking. I'll just say it that way. But how much God, Jesus himself, didn't go, he didn't go wrong by not telling people they were sinners. They knew there was sin. They knew the traps and the lies of the sin. You know why? Because Jesus, when they met Jesus, they met righteousness. And anything in comparison to Jesus, they knew they fell short of the glory of God. You see Jesus, you see the glory of God. You see righteousness. So Jesus didn't have to preach sin that you were sinners. He just came in the righteousness of God. He came in the glory of God and all have fallen short. When you see Jesus, you know you fall short. I know some of you are going to be emailing me on this part of the message. I can already feel it. It's all right. When they met Jesus, they knew what the scripture said. And second, further on in 2 Corinthians 5, it says, God has committed unto us, hear it out, the ministry of reconciliation. The same thing that Jesus did when he came into the world to reconcile the world unto himself, he now gives us what ministry? What's the first ministry we all receive when we follow Christ? Is the ministry of reconciliation. We're not called to go into the world to make people feel guilty. That is not our job. God the Father is the judge. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts. Jesus, we're called to be like him, is to go all the world and to love and disciple people. Back to Romans 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now verse 24, being justified, what? Freely, I highlighted that. Justified freely. 
Would you put a circle in your Bible? You got a real Bible, like a paper Bible? Not a real Bible. Every Bible's real. But you got a paper Bible. If that's not, that word freely is not underlined or highlighted or circled and put in the margins, put this date, August 11th, 2024. Freely. Just a little note for you to later on to know. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. There's no period after verse 23 being freely made righteous. You got to say the whole thing. Yeah, fallen short in glory of God for sure. Being justified freely by his grace. How many people are grateful for his grace through the redemption that is in Christ? Please underline that. Please highlight that. Let me throw this on the screen. Righteousness is not a reward. It's a free gift. If you get that in your soul, in your spirit, you get that in your heart, in your mind, you're going to be free. Righteousness is not a reward for all your good, all the good things that you do, all your self-righteousness. No, no, righteousness is not a reward. Otherwise, it would be self-righteousness for all the things you did. No, read that with me together, the whole thing. Righteousness is not a reward. It is a free gift. So you can't buy it, you can't earn it, you, you, can't, you don't deserve it. You gotta receive it by faith in Jesus Christ through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Wow. All right, verse 25. Whom God set forth as propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Wow, What? Because of his forbearance, God's great love and compassion for you, incredible. God passed over the sins that were previously committed, verse 26, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Propiation through faith in his blood. I appreciate that when the church gets closer to God, it begins to magnify the blood of Christ all that more. It was a long time where you didn't hear much about the blood. I think, I think for the brand new song, thank you for the blood. How many people love that worship song? Thank, we sang it last week. Thank you for the blood. I appreciate that so much. And it demonstrates that it's his righteousness, not our righteousness. Whenever we have communion, it's his righteousness, not our righteousness. It's his blood that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Jesus took our guilt and our condemnation. Our sin was judged in him when he was upon the cross that we might receive his righteousness. God cannot, listen to me very carefully, God cannot forgive sin if it compromises his righteousness. It does not. There's no other way, there's no other problem that can be solved without the cross of Jesus. Verse 27. So where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, by the law of faith. So faith is not just something that you, something you believe. There's a law of faith. How many people know there's a law of gravity? Whoa, there we go. Who would like a kiss? Anyone like a kiss today? I got a free kiss. I got a free kiss. Anyone want a kiss? Nobody, nobody wants a kiss? Abe, let me give you a kiss. Thank you, man. Here's a free kiss. Hershey's even. All of you are afraid to get a kiss. And it's sweetness. What a gift. It took somebody, yes, I want the free gift. I want what is offered. It's amazing. Thank you, Abe. We didn't plan that. No, the law of faith is greater than the law, like the law of gravity. But is there a law greater than the law of gravity? What is that law called? The law of aerodynamics? The law of what? You ever been on an airplane? Like those things are heavy. Jet engines, propellers, whatever. Anybody, who's, you guys are not working with me. None of you have been on an airplane? 
the law of aerodynamics supersedes the law of gravity, right? So there's the law of sin and death, but the law of faith super, supersedes the law of sin and death. Amen. Gravity, sin brings you down like gravity. But the law of faith lifts you. There's a, there's a lift in the wind of the spirit. Come on, church. So where is their boasting? Not in the law of man, but the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he, okay, capital, is he the God of the Jews only? No. Is he not only the God of the Gentiles? Come on, say praise the Lord. Yes. Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. I'm not going to go into the circumcision thing because that's just like, we're not going to do that today. So in other words, those who are religious and those who are non-religious, circumcised, uncircumcised, that doesn't matter. It's faith. So we cannot boast in our self-righteousness or by adherence to the law. No, we are justified without the deeds of the law. You don't have to do anything to be made righteous except, I'll say it again, believe. That is good news for me, good news for you. That is the true gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's our salvation verse. What did you do to get saved? You believed. It's good news. Anything else that you try to do to add to it, you'll just spoil it, just ruin it. So don't bother. That's what most religious people do, whether you're Jew or Gentile, circumcised, uncircumcised. But now let's turn the page to Romans 4 and I'm going to wrap up with this. Here's a whole chapter on Abraham, most of the chapter on Abraham being justified by faith. Chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say about Abraham, our father, that our father has found according to the flesh? Question mark. No. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. You might, in other words, I'm glad you're really nice. You can tell people how nice you are. And people go, yeah, way to go. Number one dad or whatever. I'm number one. And people can applaud you. Now, you might get a gold medal in being good, or bronze. I mean, you're on the podium at least. You're good. But that's only boasting among ourselves. Is God impressed with your self-righteousness, with how good you are? No, it's not necessary. He likes you, but he doesn't need you to do that. Verse 3, for what does the scripture say? This is it. Abraham, watch this together, believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. That's all it takes, people. Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness, all it asks of you is to believe God. And then you become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So the scripture's clear. Abraham believed God, and that's all he did. And it was counted to him for righteousness. I'll throw this on the screen. You can write this down. All we need to do is learn how to receive his gifts. Abe is a good example of how to receive a gift. In the middle of the sermon, while your mouth is parched, he's chewing a little bit of chocolate. He's enjoying the sweet blessing of this message in a way that he responded to the free gift. Let me ask a question. Does anybody here not have your own Bible? You don't have your own personal Bible? Not a trick question. I want to give somebody who doesn't have a Bible a Bible. Who doesn't have a real Bible? Anybody here? Everyone has a Bible? Okay. Who knows somebody that doesn't have a Bible? And do you know anybody that probably doesn't have a Bible? Ross? Okay. Come here for a sec. For those who don't know Ross, Ross helps Kyle in the men's ministry. Thank you for your service. And you're also an usher. Stephen minister. Yeah, there we go. Stephen minister. Hi, Ross. I have a free gift for you. The Names of God Bible. Isn't that awesome? It's a beautiful Bible. And I want you to have it. On one condition, you receive it. Do you believe I'm giving you a free gift? There's no strings attached. I'm not going to send you an invoice. No. 
I'm not going to make you work harder for Kyle. No, you wouldn't anyways. <laughs> Sorry, Kyle. So that's yours. It's free. I'd like you to give it to somebody and explain why the names of God are important. Would you do that in the next little while? Can you give me a report back or Pastor Kyle? Let us know who he gave it to. Father, I thank you for Ross. I thank you, Lord, that he knows how to receive a free gift and that he's willing and able to give that free gift to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you, my friend. Can't we hear that testimony? How easy was it for Ross to make his way up here to receive that free Bible? It's pretty simple, right? It wasn't that difficult. The problem is we got to learn how to receive gifts. And I think that's the biggest problem in the church is we have a really hard time receiving from God. Maybe we don't know how to receive. Maybe we need a class on receiving, Pastor Peter. I don't know. Let's do a class on receiving. That might be good for some people. I don't know. For some of us, we may receive, you know, in bits and pieces. We're willing to take a little bit. When God wants to give you an abundance of grace, in fact, Romans 5, 17, watch this. Some of you get ready because it's going to blow your mind. Verse 17 of 5, for if by one man's offense, death reigned through the one. We know about Adam. Much more, everybody say much more. Much more. This is a really good verse. Much more, those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. There's more that God has for you. An abundance of grace. You got grace to get to heaven. There's more. Much more, Bible says, an abundance of grace so that you can receive more from the gift of righteousness. Jehovah Sidkenu can be more in your life. You can live in right standing with God. You can live in the power of the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And watch this, you will reign in life. I'm glad it doesn't say rule. It's not like you're going to be a boss, but you will reign in where you are, the kingdom of God is. You'll reign in life through the one, not on you, on who? On Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus, you will reign in this life. If you learn how to receive the abundance of grace for you and the more gift of righteousness, it's hard, it's not hard for Jehovah Sidkenu to give you his righteousness. It's just hard for us sometimes to receive it by faith. So let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the truth of this scripture, this, this text in Romans, that it comes alive unto us. I thank you, Father, for all of us here who not just have ears to hear, but hearts to receive the truth from your scripture, that it comes alive in us, that we have this revelation that comes from your spirit, that we know how to live in it, and that we practically walk, follow the ways of Jesus. We walk out the gift of righteousness that's given to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen and amen. Oh, praise the Lord. Yes, amen. I feel like clapping too, Nancy. I will go for it too. Thank you, Lord. Let's praise him. Let's praise him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your righteousness. Pastor Kyle, would you bring your bride, Amy, and stand right here. Just face the congregation. Pastor Peter, would you bring you okay and stand over here. Face the congregation. And Pastor Joe and Julie, would you guys stand at the end over there? Here's some pastors in the house today, and we want to pray for you. If you need a revelation of Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness, if this is just a mystery that it's so difficult for you to comprehend, we want to pray for you that God would give you what you heard today in your heart to take with you. Also, earlier we talked about families. If you want personal prayer for a family issue, we'd love to pray for that. But we want you to grow in your faith not about works, not our self-righteousness, but the Lord's righteousness at work through you. We want to pray for many, for whoever. It doesn't matter. We'll stay here to pray for everyone if you want. But if you want much more grace, abundance of grace, more revelation of the gift of righteousness, would you come for prayer as we close? Lord, we thank you for your presence in this place today, for the time of worship sense that you are near and with us. You are Emmanuel. But Lord, you're also Jehovah's Canoe, which is a powerful truth to know that we can walk as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. 
I pray, Lord, that nobody would continue with the religious lie that they're just wretched, no good worms. We break the power of that lie in the name of Jesus. And that they are truly understand, have a revelation that they're children of the living God. And now, Lord, as we go with your grace, we go with much more than when we came. And we're not going to leave differently today. We're going to live differently today. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you as you serve him this week. Have a great week. Come for prayer. We'll stand here waiting for you as we pray for you. God bless you today.